morning and welcome to today's new joint hearing of the Council Transportation Committee and Oversight and Investigation Committees. First, let me recognize my colleagues who are here with us, Council Member uh, Torres, Levine, Ayala, Cook, and Lander. This is an oversight hearing on Taxi Limousine Commission's role in the taxi medallion crisis. The first thing that I'm going to say is that this hearing is only a beginning of many of the hearings that we will be holding. Today we are starting with the yellow taxi medallion, but one of the things that I want to accomplish is to see a level of the reorganization of the taxi and limousine to reorganize the four sectors, the yellow medallion, the livery, the corporate account black car, and the other uh, car, uh, 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 black car so that we can define the right and responsibility and have a clear understanding on what is the expectation that we expect for them to follow as they will do business with us. Annie Danis Rodriguez, the Chair of the Transportation Committee. Today we will be hearing four bills. The first is intro 1584, sponsored by Council Member Adrian Adams, which will require requiring annual financial disclosure from each person who has an, any interest in any taxi cab license. The second is Intro 1605, sponsored by Council Member Francisco Moya, which is related to the approval, approval of, a, of a, a purchase or transfer of a taxi cab license, followed by Intro 1610, which is a bill sponsored by the council member, council member Richie Torres, chair of the Committee on Oversight and Investigation, which will create an Office of Financial Stability within the Taxi and Limousine Commission. Today's hearing focuses on the decline in the medallion value and understanding the blind eye taxi and limousine took that may have led to this problem that allow corruption and backroom deals to take advantage of immigrant workers. As I have said before, this crisis didn't happen overnight. This crisis is the accumulation of, of lack of leadership in the past. So one thing that I want to be clear is that also as, as there's new intern tax limousine commission today, they're doing the best they can. So this conversation today, this question today, it's not at a personal level, but it's about how the institution been functioning and things that has to be done to improve it. The yellow medallion taxi is a, sim is a symbol of New York transportation network and for decades served a vital role in our city's transportation system for those who live, work, and visit here. But fares and ridership are down considerable and many individual medallion owners are facing foreclosure and bankruptcy, upending their personal lives and destroying their savings. These are small business owners, many of them immigrants who invested hundreds of thousands of dollars into a medallion in hope of achieving the peace of the American dreams. We have 6,000 individual medallions owner the city of New York. We need to stand there for them. We will hear a number of bills that seek to increase the regulation of the medallion market. The bill that I have, that I, my bills, intro 1608, will require the Tax and Limousine Commission to evaluate the character and integrity of taxi cab brokers, agents, and taxi cab licenses. This is another step to ensure that Taxi Limousine Commission is properly overseeing the industry and to ensure that bad actors are not able to enter the market. As a city, we, we should have done more to ensure that our taxi medallion drivers were protected. As a Transportation Committee Chair, I will continue to work alongside my colleagues and the Speaker Johnson to ensure that we help our struggling taxi medallion drivers. We must also find a way to hold the people responsible for, the, for this financial crisis accountable. This crisis 
was not accidents, and we must make sure that taxi medallion owners receive justice. Now we will hear from the co-chair of this committee, Council Member Richie Torres, chair of the Committee on Oversight and Investigation. Good morning, everyone. I'm City Council Member Richie Torres, and I'm the chair of the Committee on Oversight and Investigations. It's an honor to co-chair today's hearing with Council Member Rodriguez. The collapse of the medallion market, properly understood, should be remembered as one of the greatest government scandals in the history of New York City. The bankruptcies and foreclosures, the suffering and the suicides were not the consequences of market forces beyond the city's control. The humanitarian crisis is the product of a deregulated, overpriced, overleveraged medallion market that the city not only failed to regulate, but also helped create through aggressive auctions, advertising, and approvals of predatory transactions. Indeed, the central culprit of the medallion crisis is the Taxi and Limousine Commission, which succeeded as a speculator, but failed as a regulator. And for those seeking greater clarity about the origins of TLC's decline as a regulator, listen carefully to these words. Quote, what we've created here is the currency in the medallions themselves. We've diverted the attention of the industry from serving the public to being concerned about the value of that commodity. These words were not spoken in 2019. These words were spoken long before there was a medallion bubble, long before there were even medallion auctions, back in 1987 by former TLC Commissioner Gorbin Gilbert, who 30 years ago could see clearly TLC's dangerous, slippery slope towards speculation. He saw clearly the corrupting culture shift from a TLC that serves the public to one that cashes in on a commodity, even if cashing in meant abdicating its role as a regulator. In the mid-90s, the city began the practice of auctioning off medallions. And in the 2000s, the city took the auctions to new extremes. Over time, TLC became more interested in being a speculator than in being a regulator. It was more interested in the paper value of the medallion as an asset than it was in the real world incomes of drivers or the real world revenues of the taxi industry. It did not matter that brokers were systematically preying upon unsuspecting buyers. It did not matter that lenders like Andrew Merstein were widely dispersing loans that financially enslaved driver owners. It did not matter that speculators like Gene Friedman or Michael Cohen were manipulating the market or evading taxes or stealing wages from their workers. The things that should have mattered did not matter to your government. The only thing that mattered to TLC was the holy grail of medallion values and the money it made for the city. The city had no interest in reigning in the market and breaking up the party because there was money to be made. Billions of dollars on the backs of driver owners who have committed suicide or filed for bankruptcy or have been condemned by crushing debt to a life of indentured servitude. Drivers who were promised the American dream have been given a nightmare, and the city that sold them that American dream ultimately sold them out. The medallion market collapse is a cautionary tale of what happens when both government and markets are governed not by laws but by greed. Just like there were brokers, lenders, and speculators all too eager to kill the golden goose for short-term profits, the city of New York was all too eager to kill a once golden asset for short-term revenues. When it comes to the medallion market, money was indeed the root of all evil. Our purpose here today is not simply to hold a city council hearing. Our purpose is more profound, to force the city to come to grips with its own role in creating a bubble that impoverished and immiserated many for the sake of enriching a few. A moment of reckoning is long overdue. So too is restitution for the drivers, and so too is regulation of the medallion market, which has been left unchecked. Now, I, I just want to note, three weeks ago, we requested from TLC uh, the Roth report, and three hours ago, uh, our committee received a copy. 
The Roth report was written in 2010, and it confirms that TLC and City Hall knew everything. TLC knew that there was speculation in the market by the likes of Gene Friedman. They knew that there was predatory lending in the medallion market. They knew that the market was at risk of collapse, and it's a damning indictment of TOCO's failure as a regulator. Uh, so with that said, I will hand it back to Councilmember Rodriguez. Thank you, Co-Chair Torres. Uh, we will have a first panel composed mainly by drivers and those who advocate for them. Uh, I'm gonna call the name, Golan Istiaki. Mohammad Aliu, Vera B. Desire, Christy Peel, Good morning. My name is Beta Vitasai. I'm the executive director of the New York Taxi Workers Alliance. It's hard to imagine the conditions that are facing the drivers in New York City today. And it's even harder to imagine the extent to which this crisis that's taken so many lives and ruined so many futures was all manufactured. And it was all done in concert between public government and private capital. In the middle of it was a workforce of over 95% immigrants that have been left now practically penniless. From the medallion was first created in 1937. At the time, 12,000 were sold for $10 each. No more were sold again for another 60 years in 1997 under the Giuliani administration. Prices were considered stable from 1995 to 2002, and then the spike started, primarily in 2004 to 2014, when it finally crashed. The spike in medallion values coincides with almost the entirety of the term of the Bloomberg administration. But what we want to put on the record today is it did not end in 2014. And their sleight of hands, we believe, has absolutely continued since 2014. Many of the same government officials that oversaw the over, you know, the over inflation, the overvaluing of the medallion were the same forces that went, then went ahead to go and work for Uber and Lyft. And today, some of them even work in the state government at the governor's mansion, no less, the same person who has been the champion of these companies since they entered the market in New York City. We don't think this is a coincidence, and we want questions to be answered. We ask you as, as the city council to call those people into these halls because we want answers from them. We want to see that Roth report be publicly issued we want to see every single line of it. We also want to see the reports that were written by the State Department of Financial Services in 2000, from between 2010 to 2014, that found a number of illegalities and lending practices, but they never even issued one summons. 
They didn't issue one summons, and they never even increased their oversight. In that same time period, they still went ahead and watched this city sell 1,500 more medallions, knowing that the price had been artificially inflated, knowing that the lenders were not looking to, to have the buyers even make a minimum deposit, let alone the 20% that would otherwise have been required under federal law had they not been um, exempt from those regulations by Congress. All of these regulators, according to the New York Times, seven government agencies knew what was happening. They allowed it to continue. And in that time period, from 2004 to 2014, the city of New York made $850 million. That's just from the auctions and the, the private market transactions alone. There was another over $600 million that the state of New York made from the 50 cents tax. And I ask you to understand that these two things are connected. I was there in 2009 when the state looked to impose the tax. And the belief was that the medallion market was so healthy that it could take that extra tax on. That same administration today, in, a year ago in 2018, ignored reports of how the current surcharge of $2.50 would reduce revenue by an additional 30%. They ignored that. They ignored the fact that four drivers had already committed suicide by the time that they imposed that tax. There are nine drivers in total that have committed suicide. Three of them, 33%, are owner drivers, even though owner drivers represent less than 5% of the entire workforce. They have disproportionately represented the drivers in crisis despair across this industry. We want answers as to how these officials were allowed to keep that revolving door going, to go from public office into the very halls of private capital that they were supposed to be regulating. And make no mistake that the storyline does not end in 2014. The impact of Uber and Lyft has not been a 10% drop in revenue. It's been closer to 36% drop in revenue for each individual taxi cab from 2011 up to today. Adjusted for inflation, that's 44% drop in revenue. What we're seeing is that at the end of the year, owner drivers end up in deficit of an average $30,000. Almost every single penny they earn behind the wheel, on the meter, goes entirely to either operating expenses or back to the state in the form of the taxes or back to the city for the improvement fund. Almost none of it is left over for them to spend on for their cost of living for their families. And so at the end of the year, they're averaging a deficit of $28,000. People are dying in debt. They're maxing out credit cards as cash flows to go week to week, month to month, sometimes day to day because they don't have enough revenue even after working 60 to 70 hours a week. They're going from working six days to now seven days. We have so many members who are now in their late 60s and early 70s. They expected to retire. Some of them had retired and they had to come back to work and drive behind the wheel one of the hardest jobs in the United States of America, where a worker is 30 times more likely to be killed on the job, 80 times more likely to be robbed on the job. They have you know, some of the highest levels of stress and physical pain of any occupations in the US. And in their 70s, when they finally thought they were gonna be able to retire after serving the streets of New York for 40, 30, 25 years of their life, 
almost the entirety of their adult lives, they're back to driving, and that is absolutely criminal. It is criminal. Every single person in the city of New York should feel a deep shame when you look on, in that taxi and you see a man or a woman in their late 60s and 70s back behind the wheel because their retirement was stolen. It was literally taken out of their hands. It was stolen from them without any warning. There was no time for preparation for themselves or any member of their family. I want to ask the David Yaskis and the Ashwini Chabras and the Andrew Cuomos of this world. I want to ask the Jean Friedmans and the Mr. Merstings of this world. Did Dorina Nichescu? whose husband spent his entire adult life driving so with his medallion so he could have a retirement in case, God forbid, he passed away for his wife of over 40 years? Do, do they understand what they cost that family? She has nothing left for herself. She gets less in the medallion rental per month from the broker than what she pays to the bank. And she's one of the luckier ones because she has less than $200,000 left on that loan. We know of members who have $90,000 left on their loans and they're paying mortgages of $3,000 a month. That's unacceptable. And how dare, how dare these, these lenders and these credit unions, Melrose, Lomto, Progressive, Montauk, Bay Ridge, Omega, they all have to answer. How dare they continue to sell the medallion to a predominantly immigrant workforce who they left penniless while behind closed doors they made plans to exit the industry? All of these forces in private capital and in government, they not only look to jump the ship and go into a private yacht, but they left that ship without holes when they pulled out the oars from the sides and they left it sinking. And that's the crisis we are in today. We have also found that on average... Sorry. If you may summarize, please. I will summarize. We have found on average that not only is the deficit at the end of the year close to $28,000 for owner drivers, but also we have found that the average medallion expenses are $5,003. The average medallion payment alone is $2,800. The city council needs to establish a permanent task force that is going to establish the current value of the medallion. Any loan amount that is above that value must be forgiven, first and foremost. Must be forgiven. Two more minutes. One minute. <laughs> Secondly, there needs to be a cap on the mortgage. You should not have to pay more than $900 a month on the mortgage of that medallion. We need a retirement fund for all drivers, and we need an immediate payout to our older drivers, to our seniors who we love and for whose labor and sacrifices we are grateful for having served this city. They need to be able to retire immediately with dignity and the city needs to ensure that. The city council task force needs to be authorized by law to oversee this current crisis, become permanent task force, fully authorized to cap prices, mortgages, and free sales when, ne when necessary. Stop the predatory lending practices, require credit review, ban confession of judgment, ban interest-only payments, require attorney review of agreements, financial clinics are not enough, provide free legal representation for every individual owner driver to go through bankruptcy and other proceedings to negotiate loan modifications and come up with a longer term solution and continue to regulate, first time regulate, the entire industry as a whole, including those that are being bank, bankrolled by, by Wall Street, the same forces that worked hand in hand with the very administration that oversaw and encouraged this crisis that we're in today. Thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you.
Thank you, and because the important role that you've been playing is standing for the drivers. We extended the time for the race. You're going to be putting the clock in three minutes. Thanks. Good morning. My name is uh, Muhammadu Aliyu, and uh, I just want to go straight up and say, what's going on in the industry is not American. It's not New Yorker. I can even say it's not humane. It is brutal. I, I, I don't know how to describe what's going on here. That being said, I came from West Africa in 1993 to America. This is the land of opportunity. This is the land of dream. And I took advantage of it. When I came in, I was working in a warehouse as a helper. Until 2001, a friend of mine took me to join the yellow industry, which I did. And then there was an auction, auction in 2004. I heard of it, and uh, if another friend of mine said, you can get a medallion, which I did. And this, is what, this was my dream. And it was going nice and fair and beautiful. And this was America, the land of opportunity and dream. And I was living it until 2007, I got my house here in the Bronx, in my community. It's not many of us that have that whole house. So everything was fine. And then now come 2010, the, the dreams start getting bad, slowly and slowly. I have four kids. One is mentally ill, and then I got three kids. One is a girl, she's five years old, a two years old, and I have a seven months old. I'm, was, I'm doing everything for them. And now, today, I, everything is taken away from me. I do not understand. What's going on in this city? This is not New York. We don't do things like this in this country. We American. This is the country of immigrants. I do not believe if it's not for us being 95% of immigrants, whatever going on right now will happen. There is so much injustice, and I don't believe people, uh, people looking the other way. That's unbelievable. So today, I'm calling on you to have mercy on us. We are immigrants. We came here and we are American. We're part of the system. And we want to live in, we believe in it. I, I owe more than $700,000. And today when I check my medallion value, it's less than 100000 I work seven days a week. When I drive, I don't even know where to go find a job. I, I, I owe so much. I'm, Minus $54,000 a year. Minus $54,000. I don't even know how to get out of this debt. I think the only way out is for you to make it straight, to make it American, to make it New Yorker, to make it the way it's supposed to be. Until then, do not be surprised when you got nine people thinking about suicide, uh, that had suicide. Every single day, every single hour, I think about taking my own life. I think about suicide. The only thing that stopped me is my four kids, because one is mentally ill and the other one, they're very little. So if I do so, what's going to happen to them? Otherwise, I'm supposed to be a millionaire today, and I'm proud of it being a millionaire today. And you guys are, are, are trying to take that away from me. It's not acceptable. I'm calling on you. Please, please have mercy on us. Help us. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Gulam Istiak. I came from this country on 97. On 2006, on the auction, the New York Taxi Medallion, I buy it, $396,000. After 2014, this thing is very bad to me. When the price is going up, mega, not only the mega, the West Way, Melrose, everybody is calling to us to take out the money from the medallion. I take out the money from the medallion on 2014. So the, they make the loan, it's okay but it should be over after 
three years, May 1st, 2017. But when the loan is over, I try to negotiate it with them. They say it's not possible. And after six months later, they seize my medallion without any question. At the same time, I found that they charged me 3.75, but the bank charged me 350. I negotiated, tried to them. At the same time, I am very sick. Suddenly, they are seized my medallion without any question. I pay on time. They seized the medallion November 5, 2017, but I discharged from the hospital November 3, 2017. And after this, I have lambrectomy. I cannot work for two months. And after this, they put the loan for three years, the Newark Community Bank. But at the same time, I found that the uh, Newark Community Bank is paying to mega funding $658,000, but I don't know it. I don't want to do that. They pushed me to do it, and on the credit report, the history is nothing is over there that they are lending to the money. On 2019 uh, March, I go try to negotiate with them that, look, I cannot do the, my uh, business because this is going, uh, the medallion um, payment is too high. They offered me, you have to buy the, another medallion because you have two partners, and both of them is the collateral, and the interest you have to pay only for the three percent for two years. I have a lot of debt. I buy the house on 2015. I have little income from the house for the rent, but I have a expense. I have three child, me and my wife. My father and mother will leave me. Whatever I make the income on 2018, the cash is going to the $11,971, and the credit card is $37,000. On the credit card, it should have to pay 3.75% on top of that. So after the reduction, I cannot afford it. I tell them, do something. They cannot want to do it. The Meridian financing and the other insurance liability, I cannot afford it. They, the uh, mega funding and the other mega funding and the other uh, newer community bank they push us if you are not doing that we will take your house and the medallion then what i do i am the immigrant then i have to go to the street with my three, three children everybody have the same problem everybody take out the money buy the house and we are stuck that's the game they did it Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Christy Peel. I uh, run the Center for New York City Neighborhoods. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Torres and Rodriguez, for uh, inviting me here today. Uh, the Center promotes and protects affordable home ownership. We were founded by a, a group of uh, city government officials and philanthropy, including the City Council back in 2008 to address the foreclosure crisis. It's worth asking what a housing agency is doing here at a, a taxi mailing hearing. Uh, we're here to remind us all uh, of the parallels of, between the, the taxi medallion debt crisis and the foreclosure crisis, and also uh, to remember what we were able to do collectively at, at the city to respond to that. Uh, so uh, the, the parallels are, are, are many. Not only were there a, a series of uh, brokers, peddling unaffordable loans to homeowners uh, during the, in the run-up to the financial crisis. We see that in the medallion crisis as well. Uh, there are, I, I lay out a couple of other in my written, written testimony, um, but since time is short, I'm going to uh, try and be quick. But another important parallel is that the majority of New Yorkers who are har harmed in both circumstances are people of color. Members of these communities have traditionally been excluded from means of building wealth through home ownership and access to small business capital, so it's doubly cruel that uh, these New Yorkers have been denied safe, fair financing to pursue both or either. So quickly, some lessons that we learned uh, and some recommendations. And to address uh, your point, this is how we can do it in New York. Uh, since 2008, the center with funding from the council and the administration, uh, we've not only responded to the uh, foreclosure crisis, but we responded to Hurricane Sandy. And we uh, represent a network of housing counseling and legal services groups and, and we really, we have the chops uh, to be able to respond to this crisis as well, collectively at the city. 
But one of the most important things that we need to do immediately is uh, you know, put borrower protections in place and make sure the borrowers have access to free legal services like Barabi mentioned. Uh, it's really important that we get into the, the loan documents and we understand the fact patterns and the issues that were happening to a greater degree so we can begin to uh, make some, real, um, some policy changes at scale. No, uh, most notably, 1605, uh, requires an assessment of a borrower's ability to repay. Obviously, this was a fundamental tenet behind uh, the Dodd-Frank rule and the forming of the Consumer F Protection um, CFPB. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of concern about the way these, these loans have been classified as business loans when they require so much personal debt, and there are no consumer protections here, so that's a, a huge issue. We need to provide relief to existing uh, medallion owners. We can do this in many different ways. Uh, we can provide individual loan restructuring services, just like we did in the foreclosure crisis. Uh, we want to be able to sit down and evaluate uh, the individual financial circumstances and the legal rights and remedies that might already exist. And if they don't exist, you know, it helps us go to Albany uh, and make changes to really, um, you know, get the, uh, uh, some changes in place. For example, we had to entirely rewrite uh, the mortgage servicing rules. Oh my gosh. Okay, <laughs> principal reduction is, is critical. Uh, you can do the loan by loan approach, you can do a pooled approach uh, by buying the loans at, uh, at, at sale, passing the benefit of, of the uh, purchase price onto the borrower. Um, and direct financial assistance is also a way to help borrowers by giving a 0% loan that can help bring them current if you can't restructure a loan. But the, there are two other really important points I want to make. First of all, we must act quickly. Time is not on our side in this case. It was Time was our greatest enemy in trying to combat the foreclosure crisis. Every day, a borrower gets further, further in debt, and it makes it harder for us to help them. Uh, and secondly, we really must engage an activist regulator, such as the Attorney General. We cannot do any of this without DFS and the AG. Uh, either, you know, either we're changing our laws in Albany and really enforcing them, or really calling on uh, our regulators to enforce the, the protections that may be uh, in place that we haven't discovered yet. So um, also the city, uh, the city council administration allows, it, it's gonna take a tremendous collective will on our part to get the NCUA here and to get the credit unions here. And I really uh, just can't emphasize that enough. It was so difficult for us to get the, the banks to negotiate with our borrowers in good faith in the state uh, mandated settlement conferences, and we don't have that kind of structure here. So we really do need to uh, get the credit unions to the table and, and the debt owners to the table to renegotiate with these borrowers. So thank you, there's, uh, I missed a couple of other points, thank but thanks for this opportunity. Thank you, and we know that your story represents the story of thousands and thousands 6,000 individual medallion owners, the thousands of drivers also that they're renting, that they're leasing. So as you know, we've been working for years trying to address this crisis that we know, as I said before, didn't happen overnight. So your presentation here will help us to get the administration to answer some of them. But before we call the administration, some of our colleagues, they have some questions, Council Member Levine. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. That was, that may have been the most powerful opening to any hearing that I've ever heard. Uh, and I, I want to thank Mr. Aliyu and Mr. Istiakik for your bravery and speaking out today and, and uh, your, your raw emotion and the powers of your story were very important to get on the record and they reflect the experience of thousands of other drivers who are suffering because of actions that New York City government took. That is the reason this hearing is being held today, and we owe you accountability, and we are in search of it today, and I'm confident that that will emerge. We also owe you relief. It's not enough to make sure this doesn't happen again because thousands of families are already suffering because of this scandal. The moral debt remains unpaid while you continue to labor under this crushing debt. And we need to look at dramatic solutions from medallion buyback to purchasing mortgages uh, to putting the full legal force of city government behind your negotiations with banks 
that are refusing to negotiate in good faith with you, uh, and a variety of other measures. And I'm, I'm wondering whether, uh, perhaps, Ms. Desai, um, because I know you've thought about this deeply, whether you can recommend the course of action that you think would bring the most direct relief and that is the most practical at this time. Um, well, really, it's everything that you've just outlined, Councilman Levine. I mean, I, th I think that, you know, we've been writing hardship letters to banks. We've been filling out applications. Um, th there's been very slow progress to date, so certainly, to begin with, I think that the city government needs to bring all of the lenders in and you know, put pressure on them to modify these loans. And really, the main thing for us is it, the real medallion value at the moment has to be established, and any outstanding loan balance above it has to be forgiven. The, you know, owner drivers should not be carrying that lifelong debt you know, um, forever. I mean, you're seeing some contracts right now on million dollar loans that are 50 year terms and they're being written to individuals who are in their 40s, right? And so, you know, we, and we need the city to really consider some sort of a joint partnership where perhaps between the city and the bank, the, bird, the financial burden of debt forgiveness needs to be shared. And, and sorry to interrupt only because time is short and I, I totally agree with everything you're saying. Could you clarify again what you think is the actual value of a medallion today and what you think a reasonable monthly payment a debt burden is today based on the actual income and expenses of owner drivers? I mean, I think in terms of the value, I don't want to lend to the speculation, but I will say that from what we see, it would be between like 150 to 200,000, but there needs to be a task force that scientifically and responsibly establishes that value, and without a doubt, the monthly mortgage should not be more than 900. And I just want to remind you that based on our, our analysis, that if given that the outstanding debt, yearly debt, that families are in is, is about $28,000 a year, if the mortgages are brought down to $900 a month, that debt will get wiped out and they can be kept whole. And so that amount needs to be capped. Thank you to this panel and thank you to the chairs. Thank you. Council Member Lander. Thank you to the chairs and thank you to this really exceedingly powerful panel. Um, thank you to Taxi Workers Alliance for the organizing and I also want to thank Brian Rosenthal and the Times for the reporting that has forced our attention to this issue. Um, I really want to drill down a little more on this question of what the city can do right now um, to provide relief to the set of people who are under this crushing debt. I hope we can find a way to force um, debt write downs, but I know that we can do some things to work out the kind of public private partnership that the Center for New York City Neighborhoods and the housing community has done in foreclosure relief. So I just want to sketch out one version. Um, let's say for a minute that they're currently worth 200,000, and let's say that there's you know an average debt outstanding of 700,000 on them, just for today's purposes, so we got that kind of $500,000 gap. I hope we find a way to, you know, the task force to establish the value. And I hope we find a way with the attorney general or some others to force lenders to the table. Um, but I'm also willing to have the city put some resources on the table because the city bears substantial share of the, of the blame and harm here. It seems to me pretty straightforward that if the city put $100,000 up, and said, we'll buy those $700,000 mortgages for $300,000. The 200 they're worth plus 100 in subsidy that the city's gonna put out. Obviously, those lenders are in some ways getting over on us by getting $100,000 more than the medallions are worth, but at least they'd have to crush $400,000 on average of that debt. And then we could rewrite mortgages to those owners from this new public-private entity for the $200,000 those that are worth in a well-regulated way with like a soft second mortgage as we've done so often in housing that would evaporate over time or you know be there to make sure that the things are kept in place. And drivers would have a sustainable mortgage and we'd have a way out of this crisis that we could do soon, whether or not we can find a legal pathway to crush that debt and even as we establish a new regime going forward. 
Does something like that make sense? What do you see as the barriers to it? And shouldn't we, in addition to the good legislation that's on the table today, move forward as quickly as we possibly can to get that established? I'll, I'll just say very quickly, um, um, Councilman Lander, there are banks who, will, who foreclosed on medallions, right? And then they've turned around and resold that same medallion for $150,000 to $200,000. Why couldn't they have just forgiven the loan on the individual who made the down payment and paid that mortgage for years and years? So you are absolutely right, you know, that all of that can be done, it should be done, and that these banks, they're, they're finding ways to do it when it suits them. We need to force them to do it, you know, for the benefit of all of the individuals that have already invested hundreds of thousands of dollars into these medallions. And, and I so hope we can. I mean, if I get started on how I feel about these lenders, my head's going to explode. But I don't want to run the risk also of us holding out the idea of lender accountability, like that someone's going to go to jail or be forced to do the right thing, which we know they're not going to, and try to do that for 10 years and have that prevent us from taking collective action now to do something to help the drivers. I know that's not what you're saying, but I, I worry a little that if we only focus on accountability, we will fail to come up with a real approach to relief, and I just, I know you feel it and your drivers feel it and we feel it, we must find a way to do both. Yes. So, so if I may, uh, sorry, no. don't want to step on your... Uh, the, the council has already done this, right? So the council was the first money in uh, to the Community Restoration Fund, which helped a, a consortium of not-for-profits with the city's backing buy distressed FHA debt directly from the, the government, as well as to buy some distressed Fannie and Freddie notes. Uh, I'm sorry, just Fannie notes. So, you know, we have the wherewithal, and, you know, uh, it's very possible to determine what sort of a fair price to pay is on the city side and put it on the back end uh, uh, as a soft second in the possibility that the market might come up. But just another point, the market knows what these medallions are valued, right? To, to Badavi's point, you know, if, if uh, distressed debt buyers are buying the medallions out of foreclosure, that's the value, right? Uh, what we struggled with in getting the banks to do principal reduction modifications during the crisis is a modification today means them um, writing the debt down and carrying it on their books. They would much rather sell the banks, I don't know about the, with mortgages, they would much rather get rid of that debt take the loss and be done with it rather than to carry it uh, on a devalued basis. So I think uh, a distressed debt purchasing model, especially on a pooled basis where you could get um, uh, the benefit of it on economies of scale, uh, would really make the most sense here. Um, you know, otherwise, again, you're just kind of fighting on a loan by loan basis, which we're going to have to do anyway. But to be able to purchase the debt en masse like that, I think would be a really smart idea. Thank you. We, as you know, we've been working with this for years already. And we have that responsibility. You know, we cannot, we are against the clock. Mm -hmm. it, any time, any day that we lose a life or a great working New Yorkers, it's a shame of us. And as you said, we know that all human beings at some point go through a breaking point. And having your four children there, as you know, as the only motivation and strength that you find when those feeling thought go through your head, continue being strong because, you know, as we know, we don't have choices. When we had children in front of us, we don't have choice more than to stand there for them. Uh, how common is, as you speak to other individual medallion owners, a conversation about uh, the rest of your friends not being able to handle it and, and going through a tough situation? Thank you once again, uh, Councilman. It's devastating. I have a friend, I think, uh, Maybe six or seven months ago, he lost his medallion. I have to talk to him day and night, don't take your life. He's a very young man, and then he worked very hard. He worked deeply hard, but uh, he never wanted to give up the medallion. 
but for whatever reason, he, uh, he, has, a, he has to go to hospital, he has a heart attack. Mm -hmm. They told him he don't to push it too much. But right after he came out of hospital, he went back on the street because he don't want to lose his medallion because of his family. And then I have another one right now. He doesn't even know what to do. Uh, he did everything. He put money into the sun to go to college. The kid is about to finish. He has to go back to NYU. He pushing it, pushing it, but he's not finding no way out. So we hold behind big bill, big debt. We don't even know what to do. And my story is just like many of my friends, just the same way. We really struggling. We are not being able to pay our bill. And then uh, it's very stressful. And then uh, whatever I'm telling you about suicide, I know it's not really you. It's our life. But believe me, every single day, every time I go on the street from Upper West Side all the way to downtown, when I don't find a job, I think about taking my life. I really do. The only thing that stopped me until now is my kid, because I cannot believe what's going on in the industry. It's not possible. What's going on in the industry, no way. It's not possible. This is not American. This is not how America treats its people. America don't treat its people this way. The only thing that come up of my mind is we 95% immigrant. That's the only reason, that's the only excuse for this to happen. Otherwise, this won't happen. Therefore, I want you to go the way America treat its people, especially in New York. This is New York City. This is immigrant city. This is our city. This is our place. And we're here forever. Therefore, please, once again, look after us. Please have mercy on us. We belong here. Even we immigrant, we American. We belong here. Please look after us. The struggle is big. The debt is huge. We can't, there is no way. I'm minus 54,000 a year. How am I going to get out of it? This is every year. You guys tell me. How am I going to get out of this thing? I don't know. I have to pay my mortgage for the house. I'm not going to lose it. If I lose my house, I'm killing myself. Period. Because my house is made for my children. They're going to go to school. The college fund is going to be there for them. I'm going to secure that house. I'm going to do anything I can. If I fail, I kill myself. Period. It's not, I'm not looking for, for somebody for my life, but this is what I believe. If I do lose my house, I will kill myself because my house is for my kids. I got four kids. That's my future. Future. And then I'm not going to play with them. I don't mess around. I work hard seven days a week, no less than 12 hours a day. There is no way to find a job. There is no way to find a driver. There is no way to find anything. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And, and we know that what you are describing uh, is not only it's not something unique. It's not only about your situation. We know because very often we get the email, we get a phone call, and I know that sitting here in this room, we have other that they've been dealing with the same situation that is holding as much as they can. But we are committed to work, and that's why also the package of bill that we also uh, are discussing today our bill that we hope again, that working together we can expedite as soon as possible working the administration to put a solution to that crisis. So with that, thank you. And now we're gonna be calling the Tax and Limousine Commission who uh, they will come and testify. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So, let me also acknowledge that we've been joined by all the council members, Rivera, Powers, Riches, Reynoso, Kelo, Yeager, 
And now I ask the committee council to administer the affirmation and then invite the TLC, the TLC commission, hey, I'm sorry, the TLC representative to deliver the opening statement. So we've been joined by William Henser, Acting Commissioner of Tax and Limousine, yeah, and Christopher Wilson, Deputy Commissioner of Legal Affairs. Thank you for your services, and you know, it's a tough day for all of us, and I know that nothing here is personal, but it's about addressing a crisis that we are committed all together to put a solution. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Torres. Good morning, Chair Rodriguez, and members of the Oversight and Investigations Committee and members of the Transportation Committee. My name is Bill Hines, and I'm the Acting Commissioner of the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission. I don't want to thank you for inviting me today to testify about the medallion crisis about TLC's regulation and licensing of medallion taxicabs, and to share TLC's views on the uh, legislation that is before us today. With me today is Chris Wilson, who is TLC's Deputy Commissioner for Legal Affairs. The first thing I want to say today is that the testimony that we just heard from Mr. Olayu is unfortunately testimony that is common Rather, the sentiments are common to everyone who works at the TLC. Every day, TLC employees interact with members, with drivers and other licensees. Every, certainly on a regular basis, every employee interacts with them daily. People do in licensing, in inspection, in external affairs. I meet with them on a regular basis. We have hearings, we have TLC commission hearings. We hear the pain on a regular basis. We do hear it. It does affect us very deeply, these stories, and all of the stories that we've heard and the pain that the families are feeling. It can be, um, speaking for myself, it has at times uh, when I have heard the driver has killed himself or herself. It is devastating. It, it can be overwhelming. Um, I know from my own experience uh, to a loss of suicide that it is perhaps the worst thing that can happen to someone and the worst thing that can happen to a family. I would say that uh, anyone who thinks that they uh, are doing their children a favor because people will be better off without them is wrong. I would encourage you to uh, immediately seek assistance. We have people here today who can help you, but obviously the city has a wide range of mental health services through Thrive. I want to talk today about the TLC's mission, which is to ensure safe, accessible, and reliable for hire transportation options for every New, New Yorker in every neighborhood. Under this administration, New York City has become a national leader in the regulation of for hire transportation through innovative ways to measure and control the impact of the app companies to ensure that passengers with disabilities have access to the full range of for hire transportation services, to make sure that drivers have a voice and that they are heard, and to provide economic protections for drivers that have yielded real victories for workers who have suffered from being categorized as independent contractors, not entitled to the full range of employment benefits in the gig economy. Much of this progress has been made in partnership with you, City Council. Um, we have been asked by City Council to shorten our testimony, which I would say is something that in 15 years of preparing for hearings, I've never been asked, I've never heard of. 
Um, I thought it was a hearing. However, we will shorten that testimony in order I, you know, that I feel the need other to respond drivers to that. can be heard. Uh, Commissioner, I just want it, to, it's unusual to have 17 pages of testimony, so in the interest of time, that's why we've asked you to summarize. This it. is an oversight hearing on a serious issue with four intros. Commissioner, how long will that, will that take if you read the testimony as you have original? I would think 10 minutes. Okay, ready. Much of the progress that we have made in, uh, to help drivers has been a direct result of the partnership between the administration and the city council. Under the charter, the city council obviously has an oversight role over all city agencies, including the TLC. But to a greater extent than with many other agencies, the council's relationship with TLC is larger than just oversight. Council plays an important role in setting the agency's regulatory priorities. TLC has nine commissioners appointed by the mayor with the advice and consent of the council, one of whom serves as chair. Of these nine, the city council has a direct role in the appointment of five commissioners, in other words, a majority of the commission, each of whom resides in one of the city's five boroughs and must have the support of the borough delegation before nomination by the mayor and confirmation by the council. We regulate the industry through rulemaking, which we do at regular meetings according to the Citywide Administrative Procedure Act, but the council also regulates the industry by local law, and you have often required us uh, not only set our priorities, but you have often required us uh, to do specific rulemaking. In this way, the council has created specific license categories. You've set penalties for violations by licensees, and you've authorized the sale of medallions at times. The Council has also ordered studies and task forces to address and measure issues it finds to have a critical impact on the city's four higher industries. In the past year, the Council has required us to set up an Office of Inclusion, which we've done to offer driver assistance services, which we did and which we have deepened um, to study uh, the impact of the four higher vehicle industry on congestion and driver income citywide and to come up with solutions for that, which we've done. So during regular hearings, through legislation and in meetings with individual members, the Council has always made clear to the TLC its preferred priorities for this agency, and you've let us know when you think that we've got something wrong. But our TLC regulatory authority does have limits. We write, license and regulate medallion owners. We do not regulate the lending industry, including banks and credit unions who wrote, refinanced, and hold medallion loans. We do regulate persons and entities who have played a role in connecting buyers with medallion sellers, and therefore, at Mayor de Blasio's direction, TLC, the Department of Finance, and the Department of Consumer Affairs have undertaken a 45-day review to, under, to evaluate the role that brokers played in the medallion crisis, to identify any broker misconduct, and to consider new, more stringent regulations that can identify and prevent potential conflicts that may put medallion buyers and sellers at a disadvantage. The TLC now licenses over 205,000 drivers and 135,000 vehicles who safely and reliably transport over a million passengers a day. The taxi medallion, as Ms. Desai said, was created in 1937 by the Haas Act. It conveys the exclusive right to pick up street hails throughout the five boroughs. The city, um, the Haas Act, set the number of allowable uh, taxi licenses when it created the medallion system. It also allowed for the transfer of medallions between owners, and this transferability, combined with the limit on the overall number of medallions, is core to the market value of the medallion. City may auction up new medallions only after state or city council authorization. For many years, the number of medallions has remained consistent at 11,787. But since 1996, when the council approved the first modern auction of 400 new medallion licenses, these sales have raised a number of, raised a number of licenses to 12,000. Through subsequent auctions, that number has increased, and today the number is 13,587. That most increase came about as a result of the 2012 Hale Law. The Hale Law was a state law that was done in response to findings that the existing taxicab system in New York City um, 
did not have sufficient capacity to serve citywide and did not have a sufficient number of wheelchair accessible vehicles. At the time, there were 233 wheelchair accessible vehicles. Today, there are 10 times that many. So those auctions were scheduled. They did occur. They occurred in 2013 and the early parts of 2014. Although by 2014, Uber, Lyft, and Juno had begun operating in New York City, the app's initial growth was in fact slow until around 2015. While the TLC lacked the authority to limit the number of for hire vehicle licenses, they have always operated subject to the city's for hire vehicle licenses. And I really want to underline this because this is something that we as an agency and we as council and the administration and we as a city should be incredibly proud of. Unlike any other city, we strongly and strictly regulate the app companies here. This has taken time. Over the years, we have got to a point where we require more data on, on trips and fair payment than any other city, not just in the country, any other city in the world. We now require the app companies to pay an actual living income to their drivers. This is 85,000 drivers. This was done in partnership with City Council through Councilman Landers' legislation last year. You required us to study it. You required us to rule make. We did both. We did it. And now app drivers, 85,000 of our TLC drivers, have earned at least $172 million in, in extra money. This is not done anywhere else, not just in the country, nowhere else in the world. We heard often from the medallion industry. We heard at TLC, the administration heard, and I know you heard at City Council, we heard often that it wasn't fair that the apps had different rules than the wheelchair, um, rather than the yellow industry. So we've looked at those rules. In many instances, we have evened and, and made uniform those requirements. We've done that through rule. You've done that through local law. We've worked together on doing that so that the one big thing we heard was the app companies don't have to provide wheelchair accessible service, and we do. We agreed it wasn't fair for one sector to have that responsibility and for one sector, which had grown tremendously to over 80,000 vehicles, to not have that responsibility. So, in fact, we imposed that requirement. We heard often from the yellow industry that it wasn't fair and it wasn't right that there was no limit on the number of for hire vehicle licenses so the app companies could grow and grow and grow. And I know you heard that as well. And in 2015, we almost got there. We didn't get there. That legislation didn't happen. But it did happen in 2018. So we've done that together. So I think, in fact, uh, the TLC has made incredible progress and has done, taken many concrete acts that are designed to even the playing field to make sure that all sectors are carrying their burden um, equally. So the increasing competition from the apps was not the sole cause of the medallion values decline, but the eventual steep decline in yellow taxi trips has resulted in real economic loss, as we heard earlier, and has impacted medallion owners' ability to make loan payments and to support their families. Analysis of fare, of fare box data demonstrates this. When you look at the revenue a driver takes home, excluding taxes and fees, the decline per cab is significant, and it's well over the 10 percent that has been reported, as Ms. Desai said. This decline is only part of the story for medallion owners. Not only have they lost passengers when they're driving their cab, they've also lost the lease income of second and third shift drivers who previously leased cabs during those times when the owners and drivers were not working. In evaluating how this crisis occurred and what more might have been done to help the traditional for hire industries, it is important to look at the role of TLC but it is also important, as, as the witnesses before me have testified, to look at the role of the large medallion owners who impacted the market, the banks and the credit unions who finance and refinance taxi medallions, and the financial regulatory agencies with oversight of those institutions. Medallions sold at auction do represent a portion of all medallion purchases, but as mentioned previously, because the House Act 
made medallions transferable, meaning that they're an asset that could be bought and sold, there was created a secondary market for medallions. The purchase price of these uh, private sales, as you know, is subject to a city transfer tax, which is now 0.5%. TLC is the agency that reviews and approves the transfer of medallions from one owner or entity to another, whether that is by auction or the secondary market. And this review consists of review of several documents, including information about the person or persons who are buying the medallion, whether they're a human, whether they are officers, shareholders, partners, or members. The purchasing party is subjected to a criminal background check. All parties to the transaction, if the person is selling there also a licensee, they have also been submitted to a criminal background check. What we receive is a commitment letter which demonstrates that the purchaser has the funding necessary that is a loan to sell. What we have never received are the actual loan documents that go into that purchase. We don't, uh, we don't look, we don't have the documents that a bank or credit union had before it when it determined to make that loan. The power to oversee those lending institutions and to set role, rules for evaluating whether to make loans for the terms of those loans, uh, terms of those, sorry, whether to make rules for the, or the terms of those loans lies with state and federal agencies. First, the New York State Department of Financial Services, as was earlier testified, is a primary regulator for all state licensed and state chartered banks, credit unions, mortgage bankers, and brokers. All mortgage loan servicers doing business in New York must be registered and licensed. They, that department investigates and prosecutes fraud, and they work with law enforcement and other regulatory agencies. Another government entity with regulatory oversight of the banks that held medallion loans was the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or FDIC, an independent federal agency that insures deposits in U.S. banks. In order to minimize losses to their insurance fund, the FDIC examines and supervises the process of all FDIC-insured financial institutions for safety and soundness. But the regulator with the most power over taxi medallion loans, and the only regulator that direct, directly impacting the financial stability of many drivers today is the National Credit Union Administration, or the NCUA. This is an independent federal agency created by Congress to leg regulate, charter, and supervise federal credit unions. At the height of the medallion prices, credit unions held New York City taxi medallion loans valued in excess over two and a half billion dollars. After the failure of three credit unions heavily concentrated in taxi medallion loans, Melrose Credit Union, Lomto Federal Credit Union, and Bay Ridge Federal Credit Union, the NCUA Office of Inspector General reviewed the actions of these institutions, their boards, and the NCUA's own regulators to determine the causes of the credit union's failure and the resulting estimated seven, $765.5 million loss to the National Credit Union Share Insurance Fund and also to assess the supervision by the NCUA of the credit unions. In March of 2019, the NCUA self-audit report found that the credit unions failed due to deeply flawed lending practices, weak board oversight, and risky management decisions. The report found that credit unions often failed to do even the most basic analysis of borrowers' ability to repay the loan. These lending practices impacted not only purchasers, but all medallion owners. Set up as short-term balloon loans, borrowers were, were required to go to their lenders each time the loan became fully due, typically after three years, to refinance these loans for another term. At each refinancing, borrowers were made aware of the current value of their medallion on the market, and they were informed that they could borrow against the equity in their medallion. In other words, I believe that they were encouraged to cash out of their loans and to receive immediate funds, which were, of course, added on top of the principal they already owed and was subject then to a new interest rate. So the growing value of the medallion allowed many hardworking families to borrow against the equity in their medallion to purchase a home for their family and to put their kids through college. However, the result is that today, many owners we speak to, regardless of when they purchase their medallion at what price, 
owe as much as $600,000, and in some cases more. Although loan examiners for the, uh, for the NCUA documented these unsound lending practices, the credit unions refused to address the examiner's concerns. The reasons for inaction were varied, but one fact from the report, to me, I think illustrates the larger problem. After a law firm was hired to perform an internal investigation, they determined that the CEO of Melrose Credit Union had authorized spending of over $1.3 million of credit union funds on sports tickets for his friends and family over a five-year period. Most troubling, however, were the findings of the audit related to the NCUA's inaction in response to loan examiner's findings. That audit revealed that NCUA was available of the unsound lending practices as far back as October of 2011. However, they took no action until April 2014, only after the medallion market began showing signs of weakness, when it released a supervisory letter which it, w it was intended to establish a consistent framework for the examination and supervision that field staff used to review loans secured by taxi medallions. But instead of calling for the lending institutions to work with borrowers to right-size loans to appropriate balances that could be supported by their income, the guidance called for the opposite. Specifically, NCUA instructed lending institutions to shorten their amortization period if industry volatility was evident or expected. For medallion owners and drivers, this meant that as the value of medallions began to fall, the NCUA directed lenders to shorten the amortization schedule, therefore increasing drivers' monthly loan payments. The NCUA is particularly important here because it serves not only as a regulator, after having taken over several of the credit unions active in medallion loaning, but also as a direct lender. Today, in fact, the NCUA is almost certainly the holder of the largest number of medallion loans, and thus it is the NCUA that is deciding whether or not to provide financial relief to many of our drivers. Based on our outreach to drivers, it is the institutions that are now controlled by them that have been the most aggressive with drivers during this challenging period. Bill, sorry, Un will you mind to summarize because it's been like 20 minutes. Okay. So under former Commissioner Zoshi and continuing today, the TLC has regularly met with lenders as well as the NCUA to advocate for borrower relief. The TLC has, on a regular basis, raised the concern about medallion loans and has urged medallion loan lenders and the NCUA to write down the loans and to allow people to borrow in amounts and at rates that would allow them to continue to operate and to make payments on a right-sized loans. I know that some lending institutions are beginning to modify those loans, but our driver outreach tells us that most have not received any relief, and for those that are, often the relief does not go far enough. I hope that together, we can continue to advocate for lenders to right-size these loans and for the regulators to require that they take these steps if they refuse. Writing down loan principles to a level supported by the income a dri cab driver actually earns would provide immediate re relief to drivers, as well as stability to the medallion industry. As I mentioned, uh, as I mentioned in my written testimony, uh, we have taken several steps to address this, and I listed some of those steps earlier. I want to point out that the mayor has also directed that the existing driver assistance centers, services, that were established by local law last year by city council be expanded and located in a permanent driver assistance center. So in addition to that broker review, the mayor has also, um, in addition to the broker review, review we're doing, we will have a permanent location for drivers to come in with access to the full range of city services, with access to financial counseling, uh, including dedicated consumer credit professionals who will be there to help and to go with them to the lenders and to help them advocate for right-sizing the loans for loan relief. We will also deep continue to make uh, drivers um, aware of and make contacts to services that are available to them through other city programs. Yes, including Thrive, the mental health services program. Also, we'll have a dedicated staffer there from the Human Resources Administration who will make them, can make immediate connections to a range of benefit, city benefits that are available for people who are in economic 
or other types of pain. The mayor All right, we also need to wrap, if I, Bill, if, Bill, we need to wrap it up. The mayor has also directed that the TLC expand its capacity to conduct ongoing reviews of our licensees, and we intend to do that through a new business practices accountability unit. That unit's mission will be to protect TLC drivers, medallion owners, and other licensees from dangerous and unfair industry practices by businesses that fall under TLC regulation. The accountability team will be tasked with increasing accountability and transparency of business practices in the for hire transportation sector. To promote sound business practices, the accountability unit will collaborate with agency partners to investigate violations of TLC rules and relevant local, state, or federal regulations. We will expand the 45-day study of broker practices to the other TLC licensed businesses and undertake a comprehensive review of our existing rules governing those TLC licensed business conduct to identify areas where new regulations are needed to protect drivers. This will be fully incorporated into TLC operations and into the policy making and decision making process at the agency and working with other divisions within TLC including licensing, prosecution and external affairs. We will work on any necessary revisions to the licensure and renewal process and assist in the investigation of any rule violations by TLC licensed businesses and educating their drivers of their rights when working with a TLC licensed business. You've asked me to summarize. I just want to say, in summary, I want to thank you for the opportunity to appear today. And I just want to say that in answer um, to the question of what has TLC done, again, I think we have done a tremendous amount. We have reduced the taxes and fees on medallions. We've just announced that the re we're waiving collection of the uh, renewal fee. We've increased the amount of money available to wheelchair accessible medallion owners and drivers. We've taken control of the streets back from the apps. We've made sure that the app companies bear their fair share of responsibilities. We've capped the number of for hire vehicle licenses to allow us to study and determine what that number should be. We've subjected the app companies to um, income requirements that require them to pay 85,000 drivers a living income in this city. So I think that in fact we have done a tremendous amount and we have done a tremendous amount to level the playing field. And I believe that these are, as I said, shared victories with City Council. And when I say we, I really mean we. And I think our work continues, but that does mean that we need to continue to work together. When I uh, testified at the budget hearing in May, Chair Drum and Chair uh, Rodriguez were very clear that they thought that there was a uh, leaf had been, uh, a page had been turned from most of the unproductive actions of last year um, by a prior committee, and I take them at their word that they want to work together, and I hope you know that we want to work together, and I think we have always, always been ready to work with City Council and have worked with City Council. Thank you. Thank you. And the questions of vote for this section will be lead by the co-chair, Councilmember Richard Torres, which committed that he chair the Oversight Investigation Committee had been working for months on these issues. But before we get into those questions, I just want to highlight it that the way of how I will call TLC not to rush on the voting on rules. It, on things that are connected to the report, the report that was supposed to be due in August, a report as a chairman of the Committee of Transportation that I chair, the Oversight TLC, I only get to see that report the evening before the announcement. So I feel that in the spirit of working together, when a type of report that is a, there's a result or the work and that came out from a bill that we voted here as a council, should deserve enough time for us to have any discussion before that information is used to now move and vote on any rules. Councilmember Torres. Thank you. If I could just respond to that, um, if I could just address that point, uh, Chair Rodriguez. Um, absolutely, we're open to discussions. Absolutely, we're in the rulemaking process now. We have a month before that hearing. That, that's a public hearing that's held under the city's 
Administrative Procedure Act that's held at 33 Beaver Street on the 19th floor at noon on July 20, 23rd. Everyone is welcome to testify. We will take, we, we, we do meet, we will meet with stakeholders before that hearing. Um, just as a reminder though, the, the August deadline is also when the current vehicle license cap expires. And so that is the deadline that is um, impelling all of us to act quickly. But any chair of this committee, in this case, my case, the chair of this committee, get a copy of that report the evening before the announcement is not acceptable. Councilman okay. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Um, how, long have you have, how long have each of you been at TLC? I've been at TLC uh, since August of 2015. And I've been at, I've been at TLC since uh, February 2006. 2006. I, it felt to me like your testimony seemed to blame the state regulators, the federal regulators, even the city council, and you, you, you spoke as if the TLC and the city council is very much a partnership. But uh, did the city council have access to the Roth report until three hours ago? I don't believe so. But TLC had that report since 2011 or 2010, correct? I, I can tell you that that report just surfaced very recently. The how how far I, back does that report date? Uh, I believe it's either 2010 or 2011. 2011, I, and the report warns about manipulation of the medallion market. It warns about the risk of a medallion market collapse. So that's information so here's to what which, I know about let me finish, report. that's information to which TLC, unlike the city council, had access. I just want to be clear about that. We requested the report three weeks ago and we received it three hours ago, but feel free to respond. As I said, that report was not available to, to me or to anyone that I know of until very recently. The, the, uh, the, it's not a report, that document, um, which is a, as you've seen, is a very brief memo, um, first came to light last week that's the first time I saw that document. Um, your committee had, we had started looking for it in connection with the New York Times article. We were unable to find it. I know that your committee asked us to look for it more about two weeks ago in June. We did look for it. We looked very hard and it was located in archived email database going back to the prior administration. I wanna, can we put up exhibit one? Is this one as in the quote from the mayor? No. Not the Roth report? So recently on Brian, on Brian Lear's show, when asked about a potential bailout for yellow cab medallion owners, the mayor said, quote, the challenge is that this is a private market reality. We put the medallions out there. People, people made a decision of whether to buy them or not. The minute we saw the market was in a bad place, we shut down the medallion sales. That's the power we had. What, what exactly does the mayor mean by a, quote, private market reality? Can you define that for me? I, I would, A, I didn't make that comment. Okay. Um, B, I would need to see the full comment to really yeah. talk about it. So I can't, tell you what he, I can't tell you what someone else's intention was when they said sure. something. So what, what troubles me about that comment is that it, it sounds like an attempt by the mayor to wash the city's hands of responsibility. But the fact is what the I mayor does. I that that's, let, that's let, not consistent with all let, of his let, actions, let me finish all of the actions let, Commissioner, let me finish my point mayor. and then you can respond. But what the, what the mayor describes as a private market reality, as you know, does not exist in a vacuum. It exists within a regulatory scheme that TLC, that the city completely controls the medallion market is a New York City creation. I noticed in your testimony you were quick to blame the state regulators, the federal regulators, even the city council. I'm wondering if TLC or even the city at large feels any measure of culpability for the medallion market collapse and the humanitarian crisis that has resulted from it. If you, you're asking, if, if you're asking if I feel 
sorry, and if people at TLC feel sorry about you, the pain. Do you feel moral through, culpability? Absolutely. No, moral culpability. I feel very much pain, and I feel sorrow for the people who have gone through this. Did TLC do enough to prevent the bubble? I can't speak to what TLC might have done back then. I can tell you what we've done since, since the mayor became the mayor. Well, the general counsel has been here for two, from, since from 2006. Do you feel the city, do the he TLC did enough counsel to prevent the bubble? Time. I was in general counsel till 2014. What was your position in 2006? I was an assistant general counsel. Okay, that's a significant position. Do you think TLC did enough to prevent the bubble? I don't have an opinion on that. You don't have an opinion on it, okay. Do you think the TLC had a role in creating the bubble? Is that question directed to me? I'm yeah, but, yeah, either or. Here's what I can tell you. I can tell you that I can't speak to the motivations of the people here who were here before me. I can tell you everything that we have done to address the medallion crisis. I can tell you the things we have done to try to help the yellow no, industry no, We're, we're going to explore, we're going to help explore, them Commissioner, indirectly. you don't answer you whatever what questions you want to answer. Saved. You respond to the questions that I ask. We will explore the solutions later on. I'm asking, do you feel TLC had any role in creating the speculative bubble in the medallion market? The bubble that led to mass foreclosures and mass bankruptcies and suicides and suffering. Do you think TLC had a role in creating that bubble? It's a straightforward question. What I'm trying to do and what I've done in my testimony is to provide the context that I think is lacking, which is to show all of the market players here, all of the, all of the forces at play here in terms of the medallion market. The medallion, as you know, is a transferable asset. It has been a transferable asset for, I guess, 60 or 70 years, well, actually 80 years now. The TLC um, has a role in terms of reviewing transfer documents. But if you're asking me whether TLC is responsible for all of these banks writing all of these loans and these credit unions writing unsound loans, no. Do you think the, the lenders had a role in creating the bubble? Yes. Do you think the federal regulators had a role in creating the bubble? As I, as I said, if I read this report, which yeah. I encourage everyone to read sure. from March 2019, they themselves lay the blame at themselves for a lukewarm response to okay. the problem. So the federal regulators had a role. What about the state regulators? Did the state regulators have a role? Uh, as Ms. Desai testified, and I'm not aware of this, but she felt that there were um, documents or, okay. or that were available to them and things that they could have done better. So we know the brokers, the lenders, the speculators are to blame. We know the state and federal regulators are to blame. Everyone is to blame except the city regulator, TLC, even though the medallion is controlled by your agency. Uh, I wanna get to the question of relief. I will come back later to the question of culpability. Suppose for a moment you have a million dollar loan and suppose you have a medallion worth $200,000. The excess debt is $800,000. When it comes to relief for the individual driver owners, the city has essentially two options. The city can either pay the excess debt or pressure the lender to write down the loan or some combination of the two. Is the, will, is the city willing to pay the excess debt? What I've said is, what I said in my testimony, is that we think that you need to focus on who has the power and who has the money here. The people who have the power and the money here are the banks and the credit unions that hold those loans, and they should be the ones who should be forced to write down those loans to something that is human and possible to pay, and they should be forced to write down the monthly payments and at interest rates, again, that are affordable and at periods that make sense and that are not predatory. So since the city is not willing to pay the excess debt, have you even attempted to pressure the lenders to write down the loans? As I said, uh, going back a few years, uh, Commissioner Zoshi and other people at TLC have met with lenders. It, it did, did in fact have, did actually meet with the NCUA. I wasn't at that meeting. 
uh, and urge them to do so. And we've raised this issue pretty repeatedly in public settings at city council hearings, at TLC commission hearings, in press interviews. Now, you're, in you're, you're presently the commissioner. Have you met with any of the lenders? Have you directly pressured lenders to write down the loans? We did. Uh, there was a roundtable with some, there was a meeting with some lenders. When yes. was that meeting? I don't remember. It was in which, the last. Which meeting. lenders were present? Really, sorry? Which lenders were present at the meeting? I don't have, I, I, I will get you the list. What about it legal was probably It was probably two months ago. I've been, com I've been acting for three months, and it was when I was acting. So that, that's the only way I can narrow it right now. What about the proposal for legal representation? Is the city willing to provide each medallion owner with a lawyer who will advocate for them and pressure lenders to modify the loan? I think uh, uh, in some sense, uh, a right to counsel for medallion owners. Mm -hmm. Um, we're, what we're looking at is providing a pretty wide range of service and credit ad, and credit advocates. Um, the whole the whole package is still being planned because it's going to it's going to require um, finding space and making sure we have sufficient staff assigned to it and making sure we have contracts with different vendors. So really, everything is under consideration. I'm not sure right if I'm now. understanding. So this the TLC is willing to fund legal representation for medallion orders? That's not what I said. Okay, I so said that my I question was that about legal representation for medallion orders, whether you're willing to pay for each medallion order to have an attorney who will advocate for them and pressure the lenders to renegotiate the loans. Is that a service that the city is willing to provide? The city, uh, what we're willing to do is to provide credit advocates, who people who are skilled in consumer financing, consumer credit issues, and to go and to advocate with the banks. It doesn't have to be an attorney who goes and advocates with a bank or a credit union to downsize or reduce, right size or reduce a loan. But you're not willing to provide them with legal assistance? I'm not saying I'm not willing to provide them with that. It's not, it's not, as far as I know, it's not in the plan right now, but we're still very much planning out this office. Among individual driver owners, what's the total amount of, of excess debt? I don't know, but I can get that for you. Uh, I feel like you should know the answer to that question. Like, how could you not know the answer to a question whose stakes are a matter of life and death? You have owners who have committed suicide. You have owners whose lives have been decimated by foreclosures and bankruptcies. You have owners who have lost their livelihood. <laughs> have lost you have owners who have lost their livelihood lost their retirement who without relief are going or condemned to be indentured servants for the rest of their lives like are you telling me that TLC does not take the suffering of all these drivers seriously enough of course not to, to know the total not. amount of excess debt that has been tormenting these drivers of course, that's not what I'm saying, and you know that's not what I'm saying. Well, you should know the answer to that we question. But, but one thing that we have said very publicly, and I think that members of the public know this, and I think members of the city council know this, is we don't have a full insight into all the loans that are written. If we know the amount of the loan that was written at an initial, at a transfer of a medallion, but as you know, much of the problem has stemmed from refinancing, and that is not reported to TLC. Yeah. Although I think we're going to explore the question of financial stability, and I suspect you have the authority to request the loans as a condition for receiving the medallion. But I want to get to, back to the question of culpability, specifically on advertising. Uh, did the city engage in misleading advertising about the value of the medallions, particularly at the expense of immigrants who aspire to the American dream? I can't characterize the advertising, but it's... Well, I guess I'll character we'll characterize it for you. Exhibit two. So here's a TLC advertisement that says that the medallion is, quote, better than the stock market. Mm -hmm. Former Commissioner Matthew Dallas, the medallion has outperformed practically every other type of investment that exists. So TLC gave the false impression that the medallion... TLC gave the impression that the medallion transcends the fluctuations of the stock market, that the price of the medallion would keep rising. Can we get to the next slide? 
and you gave the medallion that the, the, you gave the impression that the medallion was a path to the American dream, right? Home ownership, higher education, a, a worry-free retirement, quote, worry-free retirement. Do you think it's misleading for the city to associate a medallion with a, quote, worry-free retirement? Is that the kind of language that a city regulator should be using? So I note that all of this advertising occurred, in, this occurred, not all of it, but the two things you've shown me occurred in 2004 and 2010. I really can't speak to the motivation of the decision makers at TLC in 2010 or at 2000. Is that the kind of advertising that you would have done if you were the commissioner at the time? I... Would you use terms like worry-free retirement? I have a pretty, when it comes to finances and my own personal finances, I have a pretty conservative outlook. So I would like to think I would not have used or approved those type of terms. Yeah. I want to get to the question of financial stability. Does TLC have a responsibility to ensure the financial stability of the medallion market and your licensees? I think the TLC has a responsibility to do as much as we can to help all of our licensees, including but the medallion licensees. But and specifically on the question of financial, financial stability, are you responsible for the financial stability of the medallion market? Again, let, let me, let me answer that. We, let me, I'll answer that question for you. Exhibit four, please. Can you read uh, chapter 52 of your own rules, section four? I'm not going to, I'm not going to read that. I'm aware I'll that that's I'll read it rules. for you. Establish and enforce standards to ensure all licensees are and remain yes. financially stable. So, yes. I mean, yes, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm aware of that provision. I'm aware that we've been right. sued on it many times, and we may, in fact, it may, in fact, be the subject of current litigation. Sure. It is. Do you, do you, so speaking of lending, do you agree that a, a predatory loan undermines the financial stability of your licensees of the medallion market? Would you agree with that proposition? I would agree with the proposition that of someone who has a predatory loan, has been the victim of a predatory loan, is not in a financially stable situation. And yet, even though you have the, resp the statutory responsibility for the financial stability of the market, TLC had the authority to deny a license to an owner who had a predatory loan. So again, uh, you could have, excuse again, me, let me finish my point. You, you right could now. have, you, you had the authority to deny a license to an owner whose debt was unpayable. And as a result of TLC's failure to exercise that authority, there are 950 owners who have filed for bankruptcy. There are thousands more who are drowning in debt, who have been condemned to indentured servitudes. So you're correct that you do not directly regulate lending but you can have an impact on lending standards because you control the medallion. There is no medallion loan without the medallion which you ultimately control. And these loans are far more predatory than people realize. Let's go to exhibits five and six. So here is a loan that dates back to 2016. It's a recent loan. And here's the statement about the collateral of the loan. Quote, all of debtors New York City taxi cab licenses and medallions, whether now owned or hereafter acquired, all personal property now owned or hereafter acquired by the debtor. So this loan, which dates back to 2016, collateralizes not only the medallion, it collateralizes everything a borrower will own in the present and everything a borrower will ever own in the future, right? This loan represents lifelong financial enslavement. These were the kind of predatory loans that were circulating and destabilizing the medallion market which your agency regulates. I want to get to the question of, of auctions. TLC, let's go to Exhibit 7. TLC, by the way, have you ever seen that kind of loan before? A loan that collateralizes literally everything that you will ever own? Have you seen that loan before? I haven't seen this, I haven't seen this document. I'd want to see the entire okay. document. We'll be happy to share I don't with think you. I, I, don't, I don't think I have uh, seen, I don't, no, I don't know that I've seen a loan like that before. Yeah. But. I've never seen a loan that literally collateralizes everything you will ever own in your life. Exhibit 7. Uh, TLC began the practice of auctioning off medallions under Mayor Giuliani and then took the practice to new extremes under Mayor Bloomberg. The Giuliani administration held three, act, three auctions and sold 400 medallions. 
The Bloomberg administration held 16 auctions and sold 1,260 medallions. The de Blasio administration held two auctions and sold 200 medallions. During an auction, let's get to the next slide. During an auction in February 2014, the de Blasio administration set the upset price at $650,000. The maximum winning bid was $965,000, nearly a million dollars. As you know, the November 2013 and February 2014 auctions were catastrophic for participants, so catastrophic that 40% of the participants in the February 2014 auction went bankrupt. And so my question is, do you regret the November 2014 auction? I regret that any, anyone who participated in that auction would experience any pain at all. I regret that. I'm sorry about that. No, I'm happy that you regret pain in the world. That's great. But do you regret the decision to conduct the auction, which led to 40% of the participants becoming bankrupt? So what I know about the context of, the, of these auctions is that they were done at a certain time, and they were done in large part uh, uh, as authorized by state law to increase the number of wheelchair accessible medallions on the street. Um, obviously, in this administration, the auctions stopped almost immediately, and I can tell you what this administration has done since that time to but you stabilize had the, you the had the ability market. to shut down that 2014 auction. It happened under the de Blasio administration. You had the authority to forego that auction, correct? Again, these auctions were established in 2013. Two of them were held in 2014. So I can tell you, I can't tell you the motivation about establishing these auctions. I can tell you everything that we've done since that time to help the medallion sector and to help all of the drivers. But by 2014, TLC knew or should have known that there was a speculative bubble in the medallion market. And by 2014, TLC knew or should have known that ride-hailing platforms like Uber and Lyft were disrupting the market and threatening to burst a bubble a decade in the making. Given what you knew or should have known, was it not irresponsible to auction off medallions for nearly a million dollars in February of 2014? So I don't know what information was in front of the people at the time they made that decision. I do know that if I look back and if I look at the trip numbers for yellow and if I look at fare box for yellow, they were at or near record highs. Let's, uh, can we have the, can we pull up the Nakua slide? That's exhibit 19. So this was immediately after, this was around the same time as the February 2014 auction, April 1st. Uh, Nakua observed speculation in the market. It said the limited supply of medallions available in the market can lead to a speculative premium which occurs when the sales price of a medallion exceeds the value that is supported by the medallion's ability to generate net operating income, citing as one example, individual and corporate medallion prices in New York City increased by 2.5 times and 3.3 times respectively between 2004 and 2012. Fair and lease rates in New York City remain unchanged between 2006 and 2012. As you know, the astronomical rise in the medallion vi values could not be explained by fair or lease rates alone. It was primarily explained by debt, not by rising incomes or rising revenues, but by debt. That was a sign that there was a bubble, and TLC knew that there was a bubble because the Roth report said as much. The Roth report said that there was speculation in the medallion market. So with the Roth document, I think, as I've said before, and I'm going to keep saying, I don't know why it was written, and I don't know what information people, uh, I don't know what people did with that, that document. Right. Well, I did nothing. Uh, I obviously, obviously